it really is my great pleasure to have Chaplain James Yee here. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons, as I think Gary pointed out, is because people sort of think about Guantanamo and habeas corpus and the detainees, and they say, oh, you know, that's, that's those people. That's those people. Um, that's not going to happen to me. Um, but, but Chaplain James Yee is a former U.S. military officer, and he is a U.S. citizen. And he spent time at Guantano, Guantanamo um, as the chaplain to the detainees there and trying to um, bring some real solutions uh, for the plight of the detainees there. He, he expressed his concern to his commanders, um, objected to the treatment of the detainees, and in fact, um, though he was commended twice, he was, uh, upon leaving Guantanamo, arrested. Um, he will tell you more about that, but he was arrested and held for 76 days in a Navy brig without a lawyer. So you can say, oh, habeas corpus, that's, who cares, you know, it's for the detainees, it doesn't matter, I'm okay. But the truth is, is that in this culture, when we have a culture of fear about the war on terrorism, the most innocent, the most honorable people like Chaplain Yee can get caught up and accused um, wrongly. And yes, he had the benefit of a legal process, but not, not immediately. And thank goodness, though, that he eventually had uh, a legal process. And that, to me, is something that this country stands for. And so we need to remember that. And I think Chaplain Yee is a great um, illustration of what this country stands for. So please welcome Chaplain Yee. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. It's, it's really an honor and pleasure to actually be here and have the opportunity to share with all of you my experience. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that the school here is, is taking steps to really raise issues uh, about Guantanamo and, and, and the whole controversy that exists over this prison camp today. Uh, because I think it's one of the very, very important issues of the day, uh, especially after 9-11, and in, in my view, Guantanamo is a, is a very, very dark spot that will be forever on the history of our country, and, and that's a problem. But let me first start by giving you a little bit more of a short background of myself. Um, a third generation Chinese American. It was my grandparents who immigrated here to the United States. Uh, both of my parents were born here in the U.S. Uh, I'm a West Point graduate. I graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1990. And I'm a former soldier, former officer, who has now served in two of our nation's conflicts. First in the aftermath of the first Gulf War, and then in operation during freedom when I was serving down in Guantanamo. But not only am I a West Point graduate and former military, but I also have a younger brother who is also a West Point graduate. I have a second younger brother who is also in the military, today serving on active duty, right here in this state in Texas at Fort Hood as a doctor, an Army doctor. And my father, who I mentioned, was also born here in the U.S., also served in the U.S. military when he was drafted during World War II. So the military culture is now rooted in my family, and that's something we're all proud of with regard to each of our individual contributions towards this nation's security. Not only am I former military, but I'm also a Muslim convert. So I converted to Islam in 1991, not long after I graduated West Point. And that's a very important part of my life experience, as it would then set up how I would then go and become a Muslim chaplain serving in the ranks of our armed forces. And I wish I also had the time today to go into my journey to Islam and what inspired me about my reconfirmation of believing in one God. But today, because of the time constraints, I really need to focus on Guantanamo and the, the issues that occurred uh, on my own personal ordeal. But it was after converting to Islam when I was in the military that then led me to study it traditionally, going overseas, learning a little bit of the Arabic language, studying Islam traditionally, and then coming back in January of 2001, not as an air defense artillery officer as I had first served, but now as a Muslim chaplain. This was in January of 2001. 
I was the newest Muslim chaplain to enter the ranks, one of about 10 or 12 at the time. And it was only nine months later that we all experienced the tragic attacks on the World Trade Center, on the Pentagon, the United 93 flight which went down in Pennsylvania. All of that happened, we know, on September 11th, 2001. At that particular time, I was a Muslim chaplain serving the U.S. Army. Immediately following those attacks, I was someone who immediately stated publicly that those who carried out these attacks, whether they were Muslim or whether they were not Muslim, had to be brought to justice because they had essentially targeted innocent civilians. It wasn't long after these attacks that I was then approached by senior level leaders in the military on my base, on the installation where I was serving, who tasked me to begin holding lectures, briefings, training sessions about Islam and the Muslim culture to those who were serving in the ranks, to soldiers, to U.S. service members. After 9-11, many of these soldiers had questions about Islam. Well, after 9-11, many Americans had questions about Islam. But as a Muslim chaplain in the ranks, my audience were those who were serving. And I began to hold these briefings and training sessions. And I answered the many questions for these soldiers about Islam. And many of them came away with a better understanding. I sort of speculated about why I was tasked to do this. And I think it was because senior level leaders in the military immediately following 9-11 knew that our soldiers were going to be deployed to Muslim countries. Muslim countries like Afghanistan. Perhaps they even knew at that particular time they would also be eventually deployed to Iraq and other Muslim nations. But nevertheless, I took up this tasking, held these training sessions, held these briefings, and then began to receive praise and recognition for that contribution. I was being characterized as someone who was building bridges, who was educating our soldiers to be better service members by learning about Islam and the Muslim cultures before they would be deployed to these Muslim countries. This praise came from the highest levels within the Pentagon and also in the State Department. And I believe it was this recognition and praise that would then get me handpicked, specifically chosen, to be the Muslim chaplain down in Guantanamo Bay. This was in November of 2002 when I was first sent to Guantanamo assigned to be the Muslim chaplain of this prison camp. The controversial prison camp where at that time some 660 or so individuals were being held in the war on terror. Each and every one of them a Muslim. Well, I again speculated. Why was I being sent to Guantanamo as a Muslim chaplain? I speculated that the real reason behind me going to Guantanamo was so that our government could say publicly that yes, we did have the 660 or so Muslim prisoners in Guantanamo, but that we also had down in Guantanamo our U.S. Army Muslim chaplain. And that would be an indication to the world, to the international community, that we were treating these prisoners humanely, that we were being very sensitive to the religious needs, to the religious faith of these Muslim prisoners. I speculated that maybe that was the real reason behind me being sent to Guantanamo.